On the premiere edition of the What's New Author Series, join Sam Baltrusis in this three-part series kicking off the first Wednesday every month at Vox Pop in Assembly Row between June and August. Our guest for the first edition is Darcy H. Lee, author of Ghosts of Plymouth, Massachusetts. And now, here's your host, Sam Baltrusis. And welcome to the first edition of the What's New Author Series. My name is Sam Baltrusis. I'm an author and journalist. Joining me is fellow author, Darcy H. Lee. Hey, Darcy. Hey, Sam. So, what's new? What's new? <laughs> I'm the author of Ghosts of Plymouth, Massachusetts, so this is a very exciting time for Plymouth and our nation because we're just about 200 days out from 2020, which is when we'll be celebrating the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims at Plymouth. So there must be a lot of festivities, things get things in the works type mm -hmm. of thing in Plymouth right now. There's a lot of festivities planned for the year, and I highly encourage people to go to Plymouth400inc.org to check out the schedule. It's uh, it's a multicultural celebration of our nation and a great way to learn about our founding fathers and the Wampanoags as well. So Darcy Mitchell, she is the author of the award-winning Ghost of Plymouth, Massachusetts. So tell me about the book and how did you get involved with writing, writing books? Well, I lived and worked in Plymouth for over a decade. And when I first arrived in Plymouth, I went to a bookstore looking for the local ghost story book. I've always enjoyed ghost story books. And when I used to travel for work prior to arriving in Plymouth, I would go to the local uh, bookstores and pick up a ghost story book because I like the stories that stick around. I think they tell a lot about a community. There was no ghost story book about Plymouth. And so I said, when I have the chance, I'm going to write that book. And so I did. <laughs> So when you started writing the book, I mean, you have a, a heritage background, so you've worked mm -hmm. with a lot of the heritage groups. How difficult was it to kind of take that, that backstory, the, the history, and it turn into a ghost book? Well, it wasn't too hard in Plymouth because Plymouth is a very haunted town. So what I did, as you probably do as well, is met with a number of people throughout the community. Everyone from the historical community to the people who give the ghost story, uh, ghost tours in town, to private individuals who reached out to me and contacted me because they heard I was writing a book and they thought their house was haunted. I interviewed people, I took with me to different locations, a psychic who could help verify if indeed the place was haunted. But then I did my historical research because I think it's really important that the stories that we tell in our historical ghost story books, that we connect them back to real people in history and real events that may have occurred. And that's really what my book is about. And just to kind of, uh, Darcy and I actually are fellow authors, so mm -hmm. I, I was formerly with the History Press, I wrote Ghost of Salem, Ghost of Boston, and several books with History Press. I'm now working with Glow Pequot, mm -hmm. so my newest book is, just not to plug my book too much, by Wicked Salem, just came out a couple of weeks ago. So it, the whole like writing a book, it's important for us to get the history correct. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole genre, history books with ghost stories. That's right. And so with that said, so Plymouth, Plymouth, sounds like it's cursed based on your book. Well, I do believe Plymouth is cursed. So prior to when the Pilgrims landed, two years prior, there was a plague that wiped out the entire Native American population right there at the location of where the Pilgrims built their settlement. The pain, the desperation from that plague can be I think embedded into the ground there. The pilgrims arrived, an arduous journey to be sure, as we know about the Mayflower and the crossing of the pilgrims. They arrived and where they arrived to was just a place where there were bleached white bones of the Native Americans who had fallen and, and lay there. Um, as I mentioned, there was no one left except for Squanto and he met the pilgrims and the reason why he survived is because he had been kidnapped years earlier and taken as a slave and then returned 
back to Massachusetts, what was then the Wampanoag and, and Patuxent area. Um, so where the pilgrims arrived already had a great deal of sadness and depression. What they went through in their first winter, losing more than half of their population, indeed, that stuck there too. You know, when it comes to the area, so the, it's so it's it's right by Burial Hill, the cemetery, yes. right? So tell me about the like the geographic area and the area that would be considered the most haunted in Plymouth. Town Square is by far one of the most haunted places, <clears throat> and we know this because there's so many reports of hauntings on Burial Hill, not necessarily of the people who are buried there. Now they may be buried there, but they were doing what they were doing in real life. Town Square itself is haunted because there were so many incidents of tragedy there. For instance, after King Philip's War, at the end of King Philip's War, King Philip was murdered in mm. Bristol, but brought back in pieces uh. to Plymouth, where his head was placed on a stake in Town Square. That's insane. The idea of having a head on, on a pike mm -hmm. in the middle of a town as a cautionary tale. Well, a that cautionary was how many tale. how many years was that on that on that pike? It was there for twenty years. Oh my gosh! And you know, even more tragically, is his father was Massasoit, who was friend to the Indians, and had a fifty-year peace treaty. With, I'm sorry, friends to the the um, Pilgrims had a fifty-year peace treaty with them. So just in little more than a few years after that ended, he ended, his life was ended so tragically and then left as an example to others not to cross them. So Darcy H. Lee was actually part of my big event last year, the Plymouth Paracon. And Darcy, I was, first of all, thank you for doing that. It was fantastic. But also it really exposed me to the ghosts of Plymouth and that, that area specifically. We stayed at the John Carver a uh, hotel or the inn. Mm -hmm. And tell me about the John Carver. Like, why would that be haunted? The John Carver Inn is very haunted. There are a number of reasons why we've been able to determine that. Number one, the, Carver, the John Carver Inn is built on an area that went through redevelopment in the 1950s and 60s. In that location, there were 17th century and 18th century houses that people lived in for hundreds of years. They were raised because they were considered houses of blight, um, poverty ridden, and so the town wanted to redevelop so that they could have a place where they could welcome tourists. So think of all that history and all that time and all that, that displacement mm -hmm. that people would have felt um, being displaced from their homes there. Mm -hmm. I think that stays there as well. So that's one of the reasons why it's haunted. Another reason why it's haunted is we know that sometimes some people bring their own baggage into <laughs> a hotel. <laughs> that is right? true. <laughs> so, I, yeah, like the, the investigation that we did in the haunted room, I forget, mm -hmm. was it 303? It was, it was 309. 309, 309. Uh, 309 was through the roof. I slept in that room, and mm -hmm. I will tell you without a, without a doubt, that room is very haunted. Uh, there was spirits kind of coming in, at, in and out. I think maybe there was a portal. And so if people don't know what a portal is, there was, do you, can you tell them what a portal is? Sure, a portal is an entry point for spirits. Sometimes it involves waters or wells so that they're able to get in, but it's an opening into the, into the paranormal um, world, the level. So in that room specifically, there was there was like a portal in the between the two beds. Yeah. <laughs> so right in the middle, and spirits were coming in and out, and we had a child spirit, we had a sailor, uh, all sorts of things. And the sailor may have been tied to an incident that happened in in Plymouth Harbor and its mm -hmm. history. Tell me about this. So there was a, a ship that there was a whole backstory to that ship. Sure. In 1778, there was a ship called the Brigantine General Arnold, and it was traveling from Boston. It was go to go to the West Indies. It was a privateer. When it reached Plymouth Harbor, it was Christmas Eve, 1778. Horrible blizzard. They became stuck in Plymouth Harbor, mm. actually frozen into the harbor. Uh, the Captain McGee, James McGee, was the captain of the ship. He ordered that the masts be cut down to see if they could try to move the ship through the ice. It didn't happen. So for days, 
the sailors were out there in the middle of the harbor and freezing to death. Over 70 sailors perished, 70 alone on the ship, and then nine more later um, from the elements. And what's really what was truly heartbreaking and haunting for the people of Plymouth at that time was they could hear the screams and the agony of the men in pain and they couldn't reach them. There was nothing they could do for them during the blizzard. So when they were finally able to reach them, they made um, basically carts over the ice, sleds over the ice to bring the bodies back and the survivors back to the mainland. The 1749 courthouse that is located in Town Square served as the morgue mm. for the sailors who perished um, on the Brigantine General Arnold. And those floorboards are the same. Many of them frozen in grotesque positions. We know this from the history of Dr. Thatcher, who wrote the history, initial history of the Brigantine General Arnold. Um, some men never claimed by their family members. And so the 1749 courthouse at night, very often you can see blue faces in the windows and people, men tapping on the windows, hoping to be claimed is what we believe. They are buried in a mass grave on Burial Hill. There is a monument close by to that mass grave that's close by also to the grave of Captain James McGee. Captain mm. James McGee has been known to haunt the memorial for his sailors on, on Burial Hill. So it, it could be very likely that just given the proximity of a few yards that there would be the sailors coming through at the John Carver Inn. I think also uh, McGee is, gets around. Mm -hmm. I, I worked at the Shirley Eustis House, which is a beautiful mansion uh, in Roxbury, Massachusetts. And he supposedly haunts that as well. Mm -hmm. So he's like double dipping in the afterlife. Yes, <laughs> yes. And you know, um, he's also said, along with the sailors, to haunt Brown's Bank, which is where the tragedy happened, where they were frozen um, off of, of uh, Plymouth Harbor. So he's haunting a lot of places. I think he was a very strong spirit in life <laughs> and remains a strong spirit in death. I mean, if you, if you actually look at the, what was going on, the phenomenon with him, it would make sense that he does return to Burial Hill mm -hmm. because he was he was passionate about his his crew and right. he was responsible. And they kind of kept that lifelong uh, guilt or just the on uh, the respect of his crew and what mm -hmm. they went through. Mm -hmm. And that also is indicative at his home, uh, his summer home, the Shirley Eustis Mansion as mm -hmm. well. Right. So I, it makes sense, like a residual haunting. I wouldn't necessarily say it's an intelligent. Maybe he's just kind of returning there to pay respect in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we find with a number of the hauntings in that area is that there's the memory and the sadness that becomes their legacy and so they're replaying what they would have been doing in life by visiting the memorial as Captain McGee has been seen doing. Um, visiting the area of the John Carver Inn as he would have been walking um, in that area to go to Burial Hill. And we find that too with a Victorian couple as well, a residual haunting there. Yeah, so tell me about Burial Hill. Like I, my experience, it was in my 13 most haunted cemeteries in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. top three for without a without hesitation. So tell me about the ghosts. So there's a Native sure. American spirit, Sentinel spirit? There is a Native American Sentinel spirit there. And that Native American spirit actually protects the cemetery. You know, a lot of people may not be as respectful as they should be right. in a place that is a cemetery yeah. where we should be respectful of, of those who have come before us and passed. And so it has been known that if people are, you know, not being respectful, then there will be a whoosh of air, um, a growl, a shout. Some in one instance, there was a limb that came down from a tree. So wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So guys, if you go to Burial Hill, make sure you respect their graves because mm -hmm. the Native American sentinel spirit may get you. That's right, <laughs> that's right. So with that said, there has been some vandalism and there was mm -hmm. a lot of press during the winter with Burial Hill dealing with vandalism and the effects of time. Right. So tell me about that. Well, there is, uh, there are 
art restoring, uh, the Friends of Burial Hill are um, intent on restoring and preserving the gravestones in the cemetery because not only is it a, a burial ground, but the grave markers are true works of art. Um, and so we want to be able to preserve those for future generations to learn from and um, see the artisanship of stone cutters. Um, but there were some issues over the winter and um, in my book I do put a, a warning of sorts um, so that people will be respectful of our history as well so that we can share it with others because that for some of, of, of the people who are buried in the cemetery it's the only record that we have of their of their deaths. So Burial Hill at, at a location um, on top of Burial Hill is where the original Pilgrim's Meeting House stood. Oh. And that meeting house served as not only their meeting house, but a fort. Um, because when they first arrived, of course, they built a fort because they were afraid of um, being attacked by the Native Americans. And so that was the first real structure there. It served as their church as well. And so I hope that they're going to be able to find something relating to the actual fort, but the digs are going on in a, in a different place, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen sometime in the future. Um, but since then, if people do visit Town Square, very near to where the fort was is where the Pilgrim's Church is, which is where First Parish um, Plymouth sits now. So when it comes to, to kind of give you some like cemetery 101, uh, if there is a meeting house or a church and there's a cemetery right next to it, that's considered a graveyard. That's right. And so there are multiple churches now, mm -hmm. Church of the Pilgrimage, where we did our investigation. And what's the, the church on the cover? That is First Parish, Plymouth. <laughs> and it's currently going through a restoration of its own. Mm. Its stained glass windows should be returned to uh, the church by 2020 and their spectacular Tiffany stained glass windows that tell the, the pilgrim story. There are other ghosts in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. There's also been reports of Pukwudgies. Pukwudgies, yes. <laughs> there have been reports of Pukwudgies. Pukwudgies are Native American spirits. Um, they have only been known, from my experience, to come out at night. Okay. Um, that's what I have heard on Burial Hill. I have not experienced it, but there have been eyewitness accounts. I have talked to people who have had firsthand experiences, mm -hmm. usually the tour guides that go into the cemetery. Uh, Jeffrey Campbell is mm -hmm. an example where he saw multiple puck wedges, and they're, they're considered elementals, so they're considered part of the earth. They're not, neither good nor bad, so they're not little demons. Right. Although, there's some photos that have popped up, and you were talking about in your book with uh, Vicki uh, Harrington, mm -hmm. she had what looked like a little demon behind her. She did, and she believes that it might be related to Captain James McGee because oh. they were speaking of him at the time, but we don't know for sure. But right. she did have a photograph with a green orb demon behind her. Yes, and she's yeah, experienced a lot up there as well. So, like, as far as other locations, I'm working on a book called The Ghost of the American Revolution, mm -hmm. so I'm really focusing on hauntings. And Plymouth was a major player in the American Revolution. So tell me about that. There's a location there mm -hmm. where something important happened. Yes, the Winslow Warren House. Oh. The Winslow Warren House is located on the corner of Main Street and North Street. And North Street is one of the most haunted streets in Plymouth, oh, by the nice. way. <laughs> it's located what's called Shirley Square. It was built by General John Winslow in 1726, I believe, if I remember correctly. He was a British general. He haunts the house, but later on his relatives, Mercy Otis Warren and her husband, General James Warren, lived in the house, and they, would host the Sons of Liberty, John mm. Adams, Samuel Adams, and we believe that that's where they hatched up the idea to have the revolutionary correspondence letters. Mm. So very pivotal as far as the, the um, American Revolution goes, to have those meetings there about planning the revolution. All right, so the Winslow Warren House now is what, a, it's the Guilty Bakery, and there's <laughs> other, other shops there too, or? There's a law office, there are shops there. <laughs> um, and it, it, 
I think structurally looks a about the same as it would have, except some windows have been removed, but it is one of the more haunted locations in town, and also one of the most historic when you consider, you know, that revolutionary heroes were right there <laughs> plotting. <laughs> and there's another big house that has ties kind of going way back, to, uh, which is the Spooner House. That's right. So tell me about that house, and is it available for tours? Can people visit it? The Spooner House is one of the three houses owned by the Plymouth Antiquarian Society. People can visit it for tours. It was built in 1749. It is one of the most, I'd say, famous hauntings is attached to that house. Mm. And it's the haunting of a little girl uh, named Abigail Townsend. And we discovered her name because there were a few seances that happened there. Um, have we been able to prove that she was really there and lived there? There were no Townsends that were living there. Um, could she have been visiting? Maybe. But the story goes that came out of the seances is that she died from an, an abscessed tooth. Very often people will see in the window upstairs what looks appears to be a little girl with a swollen jaw. As I said, I did the research behind it as did Vicki Noel Harrington about, you know, could this little girl have been there? She could have. She could have been visiting. She could have been a distant relative somewhere over time. But we also think that it's haunted by, and this is very likely, haunted by the last person who lived there, James Spooner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also a story back in 2015, there was a, a crew yes. that came to do uh, repairs on the house, the Spooner house, and they knock on the door, and a little girl answers the door, lets them in. She's wearing colonial garb, mm -hmm. and, and she lets her in, and lets the crew in, and then later on, they're like, well, the little girl let us in, and right. then they were like, well, they're what girl? Like, what little girl? So apparently, the little girl opens doors for construction crews, too. <laughs> she does, and that is one of the more famous stories. She's also been seen in the alleyway, oh. and there was a tour guide who believed they brought her home with them after a tour and then they drove her back and returned her to the house the burial, the burial hall like that that whole area um there was this freak acid accident that happened when someone got struck by struck by mm -hmm. lightning now what do you know the, the backstory to that i do it's, I it's do. really tragic it's very tragic um a young man an artist and a poet in plymouth um one of his most favorite places to visit was Burial Hill. It does have one of the more spectacular views of, of the harbor and the town itself and all the way out to Duxbury you can see. Um, he had been visiting with friends down at the Laughing Moon and said it's time for me to go and he, his name was Wolf Pascarnas. He walked up to his favorite spot under his favorite tree and a freak thunder and lightning storm came in from the harbor and he was struck by lightning and tragically passed away. Um, but his spirit lives on in a good way. Um, he was such a talented uh, and thoughtful young man and his spirit lives on that way. So do you think something like that, I mean, like other than the fact that I do think his spirit's still lingering there, do you think that something like a being struck by lightning or like be getting your head chopped off and put on a pike like is that going to leave a psychic imprint on a location without a doubt the trauma um i think is is left behind the emotion and the fear and then the trauma is definitely left behind um i think that that leaves a psychic imprint i definitely do so as i mentioned before darcy h lee was our featured speaker at the plymouth paracon we have a wonderful clip that was produced by ben alexander from one of our affiliates pack tv in plymouth so we're going to run a clip on the plymouth paracon let's check it out the Plymouth Paracon is a roving paranormal convention, and the goal really is to showcase Plymouth in all of its glory. It's exciting that we have people who are internationally known for paranormal investigations who will be with us to, uh, over the weekend. John Zaffis and Doogie and Porter from Haunted Towns. What brings me to Plymouth is uh, the opportunity to investigate, uh, be part of this uh, convention, and uh, talking about being involved with the paranormal for the past 44 years. 
I would say that it's a lot of darkness here, and I think it has to do with 1620, uh, with the original founding of Plymouth and all the death and destruction that happened in the area. So there's a tension here. There's definitely a Native American tension when it comes to the energy here. However, uh, the John Carver and I picking up, we're picking up a kid spirit, uh, so kind of a playful kid spirit, uh, and we're also picking up a, sort of a, of a, a woman as well. So there are there are happy ghosts, and I think they're happy to see all these paranormal people gathering in Plymouth to communicate with them. There are also some other things that run around sometimes up on Burial Hill that are not human. Uh, they are of the earth, called cryptids, uh, that tend to come out and tease people a little bit every now and then. I myself have been witness to it, as have my tour groups on occasion. Uh, we've had experiences with the little creatures called Pukwudgies. Uh, so they don't hurt people. They tease people. They are mischievous at best. Uh, and they just don't know right from wrong. The John Carver Inn is very haunted. The third floor is reportedly the most haunted area in the hotel. The sexton of the Church of the Pilgrimage used to work uh, maintenance here at the John Carver and tell, told me stories about seeing people down the hallway and when he would approach them they wouldn't be there any longer. There is speculation that this site was once the site of a house where medical students lived and those medical students would grave rob up at Burial Hill, bring the cadavers down to the house, perform experiments on them, and then take them back up to bury them, back up in Burial Hill. That's the legend associated with the John Carver Inn. However, I can say as someone that deals with the paranormal that this hotel is extremely haunted. I myself have had a personal experience uh, here in town at the John Carver when I was bringing my son to a swim night for Boy Scouts and we were going up the staircase and down the hallway towards the pool and there was a gentleman in a suit walking in front of us. He took a right hand turn into a dead end hallway and then when we got abreast of that spot he was no longer there. We're not really sure what it is. It, it could be the fact that it's right next to town, uh, town Square. And town Square has a lot of history, including Burial Hill, which is one of the most haunted cemeteries in Massachusetts, based on my experience. Uh, and then there's also uh, what's uh, the, the area where uh, King Philip, his head was put on a pike right in front of Town Square. So we're in, in hallowed ground when it comes to the paranormal. And tonight, after my talk, we'll be doing an investigation of room 309. Did an investigation about three months ago in the room. Uh, we picked up a, sa a male sailor uh, that's residing in that room. Uh, things that are reported, things like move mysteriously, uh, televisions turn on and off, lights turn on and off. Uh, so we're trying to get to the root of that tonight in our investigation. And then Saturday night, we're going to do an investigation at the Church of the Pilgrimage, uh, which may or may not be haunted, but it's in a location that's close to Burial Hill, and there's a lot of hauntings associated with Town Square, so we're hoping that there are ghosts, ghosts associated with uh, Church of the Pilgrimage. And what I enjoy more than anything is going in for the first time. Now, what's even more exciting to me is I'm bringing a whole group of people. I'll be with people investigating. They're going to experience it the same time I'm experiencing it. So it's the first time for me, first time for them. And if things can get validated and things occur and things happen, to me, that's a wahoo moment. Why? I don't care about what John Zayoff's experience is. I care more about what other people experience because that helps to validate it. I've seen people get scratched, pushed, shoved seeing people levitate, uh, heard people talk in you know, different languages and different voices, no information that they shouldn't know about. There's a lot of things that I've experienced over the course of the years that I can't rule out as just coincidence. Am I expecting paranormal activity up here in Plymouth, Massachusetts? I don't rule anything out. So our next event is going to be uh, July 3rd with Peter Muse, who's a fantastic blogger. And then in August, we have uh, Christopher Rondina. So the first of three this summer. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And have a great month. And we'll see you next month on What's New. Thank you very much.